Welcome again, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can make sure to join the YouTube channel directly or support at, at patreon.com slash aksum. Today, we actually have another philosopher with us, a repeat guest, Lijtadla Nagast Malaku Warada. Welcome back to the program. Thank you, my brother, Hanok. I'm really happy to be back. Yeah, I'm quite better than that. Um, I'm excited to to have you. Last time when you were on the program, we kind of did a very interesting, it was about a year ago, we did an interesting overview of some of, um, I think, the generally related topics that, that surfaced because of the politics, but it was, I think it was very big picture. And we still are going to do a little more big picture, but I think some of the nitty gritty details are very important. I remember a friend of mine who's an Ethiopian, not very political, reached out to me recently because he had been hearing some stuff. And he said something to me, I'm sure it'll make you laugh. It, it, and it made me laugh because it, it's it's so foundational or basic. But um, as far as I don't, I know, I don't know, you know, the full ethnic background of his parents, but I know at least, you know, uh, one parent is from Harar and another is uh, of a certain protestant denominational background so i i don't know i think generally from the south but I'm, I'm not sure i think they spent a lot of times in cities but he he asked me about something in politics and i started explaining something and then he said wait you mean to tell me there are amharic people i thought we were all amharic people and he <laughs> said that because i think i, I might have used the word amhara and so there's an obvious link, less obvious when people say Amara versus Amhara with an H versus without an H. But I'm wondering if you can tell us what or who are the Amhara and, you know, what what if any connection does it have like to the Amharic language? OK, great. Um, that's. Well, um, I've actually been writing about this a lot. I've even written a book in Amharic, an Amharic language called Kibra Amhar which means the glory of Amman. It's uh, un unfortunately, uh, upon uh, publishing that book, some people, uh, when reading the title, they thought it was like kind of like condescending to others. You know, let me talking about the glory of an ethnicity or whatever. But I wasn't really talking about like the glorification of uh, an ethnic group, uh, you know, against others or anything like that. But trying to explain to people exactly what we're talking about right now, because there's a lot of misunderstanding as to who the Amharas are, or there's even a debate, there has been a debate for a long time, even among like highly educated people, whether the Amharas exist as an ethnic group or not. You know, so <clears throat> I spent a lot of time trying to understand the facts and uh, trying to reconstruct uh, things that have been forgotten and going back and looking at Ethiopian sources as well as other sources like Western uh, scholars and people who've studied Ethiopia like authorities and so forth. And uh, it's a very profound uh, topic, uh, not because, uh, because it's not just limited to like, you know, studying an ethnicity. It's much mm -hmm. uh, bigger than that in a sense. So the Amhara people are a Semitic speaking people, uh, first and foremost. Uh, it's important to understand that their language, the language uh, Amharic uh, has served as Ethiopia's official language uh, and uh, court language for a long time, for at least uh, some seven to 800 years, at least. And uh, we know that because there's a documentation of it and uh, the uh, restorer, uh, of the Solomonic dynasty in the 1300s by the name of, uh, well, in the, the 1200s, in the 13th century, by the name of Ikunno Amlak was from the house of Amhara, the Beta Amhara, which was a province, the province of Amhara people, uh, or the core rather, right? And that's the Solomonic dynasty sort of like sprung and flourished in that, uh, in that, in that province. What is modern day Wallo, right? Well, what yeah. was more modern Wallo and then subsumed into today's Amhara region? Yes. Uh, so uh, like southern Wallo and northern Shoa, 
actually. Mm-hmm. So the northern, like Shoa, uh, as a province, was mentioned back then as well. But it was it expanded more toward the south and like the northernmost part of uh, the province of Shoa would be like the central part of Shoa, like mm-hmm. in our time. So <clears throat> that that was the core area. And we're going to come back to like how, you know, that developed. But um, so this language has served as Ethiopia's official language for centuries upon centuries. And uh, originally it's the language of the Amhara people, right? And it's uh, important to note that um, not only is it a Semitic language, but it's the second most spoken Semitic language in the world. So first comes Arabic which is the most widely spoken Semitic language in the world. And then right after it comes Amharic. Then every it's not even close. Up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so Hebrew, um, you know, all the other uh, Semitic languages come after that in terms of like, you know, how many people speak these languages. So there's that. Uh, that's one thing to note. And also what's very important to understand in order to understand the genetic uh, and uh, anthropological uh, reality and the facts regarding the Amhara people, because note that we're we're in the African continent, we're mm-hmm. in the African continent, but we are in the Horn of Africa. That's where Ethiopia is, and then Yemen is like one of our neighbors. It's it's funny because there's only like thirty kilometers of distance between. Uh, Ethiopia's plateau and, and Yemen across the Red Sea, only 30 kilometers. So someone could probably swim <laughs> there. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> but like, you know no, but for sure. The, yeah. yeah, there are people who do that. Yeah, well, there you go. So imagine the kind of interaction, like the kind of like uh, for centuries and for thousands of years, <clears throat> because both the Ethiopian civilization, the Yemeni, uh, civilization have been around for a long thousands of years and there even was a time when uh, plausibly they were one kingdom one unified kingdom uh, during the times of the Sabaeans for example so the Amhara people it's very important to note that according to some sources according to some sources have a connection to the ancient uh, Sabaeans and Himyarites. now there are arg- like people who argue that that's not necessarily uh, true because of like you know genetic evidence saying otherwise but what we know at least for sure is that um, uh, phenotypically and and also in terms of culturally and even the alphabets that we use there are like huge similarities uh, and even anthropologically there are huge similarities and also uh, the greatest queen of uh, you know Ethiopian history and Amhara culture is the queen of Sheba uh, and Shiva means Saba, Sabaeans, you know? So there's that fact. And the his language is, you know, the ancestral language to the Semitic people of Ethiopia is closely related to ancient Sabaean, closely related. So these facts are noteworthy. Uh, so the Sabaeans and the Hemirites, there are sources, other sources that relate the uh, origin of Amharas uh, to uh, the identity of the ancient Himyarites and the Aksumites. You know, Aksum and Himyar were also very closely related. There are times when the Aksumite kings, uh, you know, upon the you know their inscriptions, uh, state uh, or yeah, still it's verifiable, state that Himyar and Raidan, which are like ancient uh, polities in Yemen in modern day Yemen, right, were part of their dominions you know so there's that and the other <clears throat> the other additional uh, uh, perspective uh, is that we also have ancestry Amharas have ancestry uh, that can be traceable to the ancient Levant and that's you know modern day uh, Israel uh, Syria the Lebanon area you know that area in general so, and that is also uh, genetically substantiated. Um, and uh, there's actu- actually a publication, there are several publications uh, about, about that. One I saw on uh, 
Uh, there's, uh, uh, I don't know if you know about Sci News, so like scientific news, Sci News is uh, published uh, an article about that with the genetic, you know, uh, evidence saying and trying to relate that to, because the gene flow, you, you know, genetics can tell you about history because the gene flow from the Levant to the Ethiopian plateau happened 3,000 years ago, which is consistent with the Ethiopian legend of, you know, uh, the time that the ancient Israelites uh, came to Ethiopia uh, and the times of, you know, Sheba and uh, Menelik I. So uh, it's important to sort of like map that out to try to understand who the Amhara people are, Semitic speaking people closely related and we're talking about the beginnings the, the ancestry and the origin of, of these people uh, uh, so that gives us the perspective and the ancient Sabaeans the Himyarites and also the ancient Levant people uh, who are uh, in today's you know uh, Israel and Syria and Lebanon uh, regions and the other part is also uh, you, you know in the Ethiopian uh, the Ethiopian highlands. You have the ancient Ago peoples, right? And these are the Kushites, the ancient Kushitic uh, speaking people uh, who lived in that area, uh, who uh, inhabited the Ethiopian uh, highlands for a long time. Uh, but they're not, it's important to understand that Ago is not one ethnicity. Like there mm -hmm. are uh, Ago, it's like ethnic groups who have uh, Ago languages that are not uh, intelligible. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, and and you also find them in Eritrea, for example, the Bilen people, the Bogos people, they're Agos, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, and uh, today's Amhara region, uh, that's where you can find them. So it's a mixture. So the identity of uh, Amhara's the number of Amharas, by the way, Amharas are what, like some 40 million people. Uh, uh, some try to say that it's more, but they'd have to, you know, people say that. So always important to substantiate these uh, claims with uh, at least, you know, statistical factors, some other uh, scientific way to show that, you know, uses logic and reason to show that this is it. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's on it's on that point that I have a question. Like, yeah. even when people talk about being Oromo and some of these and Tigray and all these other identities within our larger empire, there's it seems a back and forth between is it whether or not someone speaks the language? Is it a genetic component? Is it some combination of these and cultural assimilation? Because now you say, um, I, I imagine there are people today who are of, let's say, more and less Ago stock, as well as that original G speaking tribe which came to speak Amharic stock. Obviously, you know, everyone, if not very close, like in the 90 percentile of people in that those regions are are mixed, you know, is how do you see the relationship between, you know, uh, let's say, for example, probably the rulers were more of the G stock, but they're also Ago. And the ones who are not rulers are maybe more of the Ago stock than the, the G stock or the Amharic stock. But but everyone is is mixed. How do you see the, the kind of confluence or the, the relationship between, you know, the genetics of it versus the the culture of it because i think that goes to my friend's question which was very innocent but it you know it caused you to chuckle and it, and it caused me to chuckle too because when when he grew up he grew up in a household where they just spoke amharic to him i believe they had uh Gesinan or uh Adarinya, another semitic language in their household and and maybe maybe others uh, but you know he for all intents and purposes he just knew about amharic and barely spoke that yeah well <clears throat> that, I mean, it's an interesting uh, perspective that you provided there. Um, I would say, from my understanding, actually, like you could probably find a greater uh, degree of mixture among the royal houses because of mm -hmm. political marriages. Yes. In order to, you know, uh, fortify uh, the kingdom uh, or the empire. But you have on like enclaves of people, for example, Amharas, there are 
areas more there's a, a little like I don't like using the word purity but uh, more like more amhara and there are er- areas that are more mixed but like everybody's mixed that mm-hmm. needs to be understood because that the even the term havisha right uh, the very term havish has historically had become synonymous with kilis which means uh, or dvilik kilis or div, which means mixed those of mixed blood right so uh, even though the origin of the word is not that necessarily was used uh, by uh, uh, Ezana, uh, the Aksumite king, uh, to refer to a group of, you know, an ethnic group in the ancient times. And also, uh, I believe it was also used by the, by the Egyptians to refer to the people living in the uh, Punt uh, kingdom in ancient times, right? So Khipsi or Habasha or Habashi, that term is very, very ancient. And it's not a derogatory term, by the way. So... <clears throat> But you know, we know at least for sure that uh, in the span of like 4,000 plus years, there's been a lot of mixture uh, in that mm-hmm. in, in that region, like ancient, uh, and uh, you know, all kinds of uh, you know the gene flow from the Middle East. And I also suspect, uh, for example, uh, during the Hellenistic era, uh, you know, there was a close connection between the ancient Ethiopian. Uh, uh, or Aksumite uh, kingdom, or and pre-Aksumite kingdom, and the civilization of the Greeks. Uh, so, yes. uh, I'm pretty sure. And we even used, for example, if we look at the inscriptions, uh, uh, you know, uh, written by Aksumite kings. We're gonna find the Sabaean language, the Giz language, and the Greek language, the ancient Greek language. So there, there was that kind of c- connection there. So I, I would say that our mixture is not even limited to just, uh, you know, northern East Africa and the Middle East, but could even expand to like the Mediterranean, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's much wider than we understand. And so very that, multilingual like you and me today. Yeah. <laughs> and you can, you can also, oh, who was it? I believe uh, it was uh, Edward... Uh, Ullendorf, the um, a British historian, late British historian, who was an authority in Ethiopian studies, especially uh, Hebraic in Ethiopia, uh, where he he mentions that you can see it in our faces. You can see that that mixture, that ancient uh, mixture of uh, different uh, genes and uh, cultures in our faces. You can you can look at Ethiopians. You can differentiate the Habesha race. Uh, so to speak, from any other, just by looking at at Habesha's. So you can see it. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, just... a, bla- a black friend just sent me a black American friend who has some uh, American, you know, British white ancestry himself. Uh, he sent me an image lately of a Palestinian Jordanian uh, singer, and he had like the same mustache as me. And he sent it to me and he said, this guy looks just like you. You have a doppelganger. And I laughed <laughs> and I, I, I told him about the gene flow that, that you just mentioned. Yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, that needs, to, this is also why I have a problem personally, uh, the modern categorization, like the racial categorization of, of people, uh, Ethiopians, uh, like, or, and specifically Habeshas, uh, are not wants to fit in these categories, right? And there's also, and actually Habesha has challenged that in the, in the U.S. ever since, you know, the diaspora of uh, Ethiopians uh, started growing. The challenge was Ethiopians or Habeshas were creating sort of like their own subgroup of, or group of like racial stock in a way and challenging the, like this, 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 uh, you know, and, 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 and this is the reason. Uh, there was a certain degree of self-awareness in that sense. And now it's kind of dissipating because you're just like, um, no one really cares in a way. And, and yeah. also, but it's important. It's important for knowledge, you know? Uh, it is. I used to just put black and more recently, whenever I'm, you know, on any of those forms, I would just put two or more races. And sometimes yeah. it doesn't ask you to specify further. When it forces you to specify further, sometimes if it has, you know, a Middle Eastern option, you could add that. 
uh, you know, I'd prefer the term Near Eastern or something, but close enough. Like in, yeah, in college, yeah. I had to identify as Greek Orthodox because they didn't have Ethiopian Orthodox and they force you to pick a bubble. But, uh, you know, where our people are from in that area described, it's like the border of Asia, Europe, and Africa. So when you have to decide between Asian and white as the second one, that's where, when you get stuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the funny thing is, if you're, like the term black has um, uh, connotations that are more than color, you know? So it has a cultural connotation. It's used for race. Uh, and some people who misunderstand this could think, for example, oh, how dare, if you're African and you don't pick black, how dare you? You're like uh, so, like self-loathing or whatever. But it, but that's not true. It's, it's the fact, what, like the truth, right? The truth about like who we are is this. Uh, you know, this is who we are. We're mixed people, first of all. And second of all, uh, like, it, there's no obligation. That you have to, like, understand what you are and then express what you are because... Like, if you don't do that, then there's something that you're letting go without understanding you're being categorized in a group that in which you don't necessarily fit in, you know? So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the, so the, the Amhara have this uh, history and lineage that, that you've mentioned, and they find themselves as the rulers, as the clergy, and as the peasant self uh, subsistence farmers who are always ready and armed in existential moments of existential crisis to to handle problems how how do you differentiate or see them as different or the same or similar to the other groups of ethiopia you know particularly bringing it into the modern area you know we we went back to the ancient times but a lot of foolish commentators think that history begins in the 1800s. So we at least covered some of the bases and we, and we talked about it in depth and I'll link to our, our old episode so people could see that discussion more in depth. But how do you see the Amhara in, in relation to some of the, the other major groups? You mentioned the Ago and how Ago is, is more like a, a larger category of which there are many other subcategories i i mentioned the tigre the oromo the burage the adare i mean many 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 different the somali uh that are within ethiopia as well how, how do you see their their kind of uh, relations yeah well so um when we look at the development of you know the ethiopian state right and you know ethiopia as an empire uh, or a kingdom and now what we see is that, for, first of all, the movement of, of Amharas in history, right? Like the very ancient origin of Amharas that we talked about on the, it, 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 like, on, like in Ethiopia and the Ethiopian highlands and also, you know, just in that area in general, sort of expanded from north to south. Mm -hmm. So the closest uh, uh, culturally, uh, almost identical, almost identical uh, uh, ethnic groups are, you know, the Agos and the Tigrayans, uh, for example. And uh, the reason for that being that, uh, that uh, like, both Amharas and Tigrayans have this, you know, direct uh, connection, cultural and genetic, to the Agazian, or the good people, uh, the ancient uh, good speaking people. And their language the uh, languages to bring an Amharic are also very closely written, despite some, you know, small differences. Um, but then you also have, like you mentioned, the Adares, for example. The Adares also uh, sort of like migrated down from the Tigrayan area, by the way. And, uh, <clears throat> and other Semitic speaking group, Gurage, group, yeah. groups, like the Gurages, and uh, and even ones that uh, have uh, that are now extinct, like the Gafat, for example, mm -hmm. Gafat people. So all of these people sort of like have the same kind of you know cultural and genetic origin in a way. Yeah. But then the Amharas came out as like the you know strongest like force in a way by being the like 
the core power of, of the kingdom and uh, the progenitors of like the dynasty, the Solomonic dynasty, which flourished in the north and then, you know, with the Amharas it came down. So, and then other people, the other ethnic groups are also related to Amharas through uh, intermixture, you mm -hmm. know, and like what, uh, how Amharas, like the <clears throat> appearance of Amharas now in our time and Amharas a thousand years ago is not necessarily the same, you know, and that shows you that there's, a, a, in the past thousand years, for example, there's been, you know, as the kingdom sort of like, after the fall of the Aksumite Empire, uh, there was the Zagwe uh, dynasty for some time, but then the restoration of um, uh, Yukuno Amlak's dynasty or Solomonic dynasty sort of came with a plan. There was uh, a pattern that his descendants were following that was set by him, which was to uh, restore the uh, old dominion, like the territories of like the Aksumite Empire that were lost. And other groups in, uh, in the south and the east were encroaching upon uh, you know, those uh, borders and also even uh, uh, you know, invading the areas mm -hmm. and uh, controlling them. So they were engaged in warfare to try and regain these territory. So th throughout that pattern, what you see is a lot of like Amharas from like the north and even the Guragis came to be in that way. You know, they came from the north, but then yeah. they stayed now there in the south, like in the southern people area, and also in Shoah, uh, uh, because of, you know, uh, this program, right, project of, like, restoring the kingdom. So uh, through that process, there's been a lot of, like, wahdat, right, intermixed. Um, and as a result of that, you can see that uh, a lot of Ethiopians you know, look alike. They look alike. And, and, and there's a lot of, we share a lot uh, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, culturally and genetically, by the way, right? Uh, with Amharas share a lot of values uh, with pretty much all other Ethiopians. So uh, there's that. I mean, yeah. The striking examples that I've seen you post before and that I've looked at before is like, if you wanted to say anything about the image of Lul Ras Kasa. The, the cousin and you know if we had a different system closer to the throne than his cousin Emperor Haile Selassie as well as further back you know his I think last ancestor on the throne if I'm not mistaken directly uh, Libbana Dingil on the yeah on the Shoan line yeah 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 so in terms of how you were saying the the Melk or the image through uh, uniting over time has changed, and you could kind of see these historic photos. Uh huh. Yeah, you can see them, and you can uh, you can tell the difference. But but then you can also see some of it has also been preserved and, and maintained, like the culture, especially, and then even even the looks. You can you can still kind of see that there's that uh, very Semitic and uh, very uh, break you know, appearance and, and expression. And also, uh, you know, for example, I'd like to mention that, you know, uh, things that we don't necessarily pay attention to that we still do and uh, our people don't seem to understand the relation between that and, you know, the biblical practice of the ancient, uh, uh, you know, Israelites, for example. Uh, and I say that because, you know, we understood that, but now in our time, it's kind of become uh, oblivious. But uh, the Talit, for example, uh, uh, in uh, uh, it's the fringes or tassels in you know the traditional male Jewish uh, garment. Talit is Talat. <laughs> you know, it's the same thing. And then you have the the well the fringes I was talking about were the uh, tzitzit. You know, or tzazat, tzitzit is what they call it. Tzazat, we call it kuchet. They're the tassels, you know. Uh, so <clears throat> that we wear, we have these things. And we have so many practices, similarities, like, you know, I've talked about elilta, for example. Mm -hmm. elilta, ululation, yeah. Yeah, ululation. Uh, <laughs> in Hebrew. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that is a very ancient Semitic practice. You know, uh, that was uh, uh, the procession of the Ark of the Covenant, the cult of the Ark. You know, that is a first temple period practice that we still have. When when a replica of the Ark comes out, it's not just about having a replica of the Ark. It's what we do. Like when the when the Ark comes out, the way we worship is very reminiscent of like Samuel, uh, like, um, you know, in the Old Testament, Second Samuel, you, you can, he describes how, uh, you know, the behavior and worship of the ancient Israelites around the ark. And it's like mind blowing how uh, w- when we look at what we do here still in our time, it's exactly that, you know. Uh, and yeah, it's not just the language. The language is Semitic. Uh, we use words uh, like mitzvot, mitzvot, you know, like that are one and the same. We just pronounce it different. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, but uh, these practices in Amhara culture uh, that we see, I kind of forgot why I brought this up, but like there was. A- uh, I, I, I got you. Yeah. And the, the mitzvot, mitzvot is even crazy because the V sound is the it's the Ashkenazi Jewish pronunciation. But actually, for example, the Yemeni Jews and other, uh, you could say Mizrahim, they do it with a W. And the letter is a W. And I, I just picked up Hebrew over the uh, over the break. I'm no expert, but I'm a beginning biblical Hebrew reader. And I it blew my mind. They literally use wa for and, which is the same word in yes. uh, Gez. And a lot of times they change those Ws into Vs. So it makes it look even more distant than it actually is. But yeah, it's, it's right there. The word for almsgiving. But this this was all in terms of talking about the connections in back in the day. I think the sanatsal is a is another great example. The the sistra, the musical instruments. Yeah, every asset aspect of the the religion and the political structure, from the Akkadian society to the Assyrian society to the to the you know the ancient Israelites. You, you see a million connections uh, on the Mediterranean. Um, I've spoken before about the Minoan civilization. There are a million, uh, if you see the frescoes of, of the Minoan civilization, they have uh, Maquamia, the staves and the Sanazel. I mean, it's it's incredible. I guess to bring it to a more contemporary time with all of these connections, how would you say, be, uh, like, what led to the demonization of this group, the Amhara? especially with all the similarities with, with some of these other people. At, at some point in the 20th century, uh, I spoke uh, recently with our, our mutual friend and friend of the Crown Council, Deacon Salomon, uh, about the recent movie Grandpa Was an Emperor, which is one of the great, and I think first time, the royal family, the, the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren of Emperor Haile Selassie got together with other filmmakers and produced their point of view, their perspective of what happened on the fall of the monarchy. And I don't know if it began with the coup in the in the early 60s with the Nawai brothers the, the, in the military, but where, where do you see the beginning of the, the demonization of the Amhara? Uh, a lot of people point to that book, The Powder Barrel, by the, uh, the German speaker. I think he was Austrian or something. Um, yeah. Yeah, where, where, where do you see the origin of the demonization of the Amhara? And if you could slowly begin there and, and we can bring it to kind of contemporary events that are going on. Sure. I would, uh, Roman Prochaska's uh, book, some, I think it's like some 50 pages. It is literally definitely one of uh, the things that must be mentioned about demonizing Amharas. And like, that was literally like a roadmap uh, of, uh, trying, to, you know, the the way to destroy Ethiopia by uh, targeting Amhara, and and when you read that, you find that uh, there there's been a plan uh, by, you know, um, existential <laughs> enemies of, of Amhara people uh, who devised and and, and planned uh, this by indoctrinating all other ethnicities in Ethiopia, uh, that Amhara people are uh, their enemy and uh, and that uh, uh, like in order to become free or to be liberated, that they had to uh, overcome the Amhara people. 
So this cut, this this message is an old message from from that time, the twentieth, the early twentieth century, uh, that has taken hold and has literally become the constitution of Ethiopia in our time. But it's not just that. You also have um, uh, Donald Levine talks about this, by the way. Uh, he talks about the Marxist ideology of the oppressor and the oppressed. And he says that the movement in Ethiopia in the 1960s found the oppressor in the image of the wicked Amhara. So uh, the Marxist uh, Leninist movement in Ethiopia sort of appropriated that uh, doctrine, um, like brought it and, and like the oppressed are like, uh, you know, develop this ideology. Uh, and one of the known personalities uh, that spearheaded this this uh, ideology was Waleling Makon. From, he was an Amhara himself, by the way, from Wallo, but mm-hmm. he was like completely indoctrinated, like uh, considered himself like a revolutionary, a Marxist revolutionary in Ethiopia. And he, <clears throat> uh, him and other people, uh, you know, other students and rebels, saw the Amhara people as the oppressor, like the oppressor of Ethiopia, and that all other ethnic groups are like in prison, you know, like they're, they've they been imprisoned by this empire, uh, the, the say, Ethiopian empire that serves the Amhara people and nobody else. So they developed that thinking, which is false, but we can talk about that. But, but that led to that. And also, just to add one more, Henry Kissinger, uh, that there's been... Uh, there's a there's a book uh, written by Ted Vesto. He's a, um, a professor emeritus. Uh, um, I think it's Oklahoma Uni- University of Oklahoma. He wrote about this that there's information that leaked uh, that uh, during the uh, during the presidency of Nixon, there was uh, I believe it was in 1972. Uh, two years before the fall, uh, the uh, uh, fall of the monarchy uh, in Ethiopia, <clears throat> there was a plan to uh, weaken uh, Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa by uh, using the vulnerability, like what was already happening that we mm-hmm. just talked about. You know, the anti-Amhara sentiments to like fuel that and to use. Uh, you know this uh, against against Ethiopians and especially targeting Amhara people. So it's and that was a foreign policy, basically. So there's that of the and, of the United States. Yeah, I I know Roman Prochaska's view was basically look at all these oppressed people. So instead of the Amhara, then the Italians should come rule them all. Uh, so yeah. the Americans had their own kind of mind about it too. I wonder then about these own Amhara elites. I'm sure he wasn't the only one who you mentioned, but their own, like our own elites, as well as other people within the country and the other elites of other groups kind of bought this ideology hook, line and sinker of the Marxist Leninism that they then copy pasted and edited to replace this, uh, you know the oppressor there instead of class analysis with a with an ethnic linguistic analysis. What was their solution? Obviously, their solution. So there's a United States Henry Kissinger foreign policy. There's a foreign policy of Italy. The people in our own country. Uh, I don't know. Do you think they were just like traitors working for other governments, or what was their what was their vision? Revolutionaries wanting their they own. System? They never. They never had a vision. They were, first of all, they were rupees, you know, they didn't have the intellectual, uh, like, sophistication to, you know, if you're going to overthrow a government, you, you have to have a plan. Like, if uh, after that, what are you going to do? What, who are you going to bring um, to, you know, to that a position of power? So they didn't, they didn't know any of that. For example, when the Del was a military uh, junta or whatever, like at the time, you know, it was a, did, they didn't have any ideology, but there were groups underground who had these Marxist ideologies 
like Meison and Ihapa. Uh, and these were the two uh, rivals uh, at the time. And then the Derg was just uh, looking at them and trying to take the winner, you know, and, and, and you know, incorporate th their ideology into, um, you know, it's, it's governance or whatever. So because they didn't have any ideology and they didn't, they really didn't know what they were doing. They even considered like just removing Haile Selassie and, and maintaining the monarchy. You know, the Al Gaurash. <laughs> that would have uh, been hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because this is how how unsophisticated they were. They just ki like uh, kill everybody and, and um, uh, remove the emperor. And then now they don't know what to do. So they're considering keeping the monarchy. You know? What are you doing? So. <clears throat> But then uh, the crown prince refused to collaborate with them. So after that, they decided that uh, uh, they're, they, they were gonna become like a communist uh, regime and they did. Uh, so so after that, Mason is the main group that took power and then Ihapa became like the, you know, uh, the enemy. And because of that, there was like red terror, white terror, like white terror was like Yapa's terror and red terror was like uh, the Dirk uh, regime's terror. So uh, that's what happened. And uh, that at the anti-Amhara sentiment uh, and, uh, and uh, ideology developed in that. It was there. Even when the Dirk came, um, you know, the majority of the uh, uh, people who were in, Positions, positions of power uh, during the Derg regime were Oromo. Um, and, you know, the uh, uh, right, Mikhail Andom, who was an Eritrean, was like the very first leader of the Derg, and he didn't survive in office immediately. He, he was in for like a month or two, and then he was gone. And then after that, he was killed. Uh, and after that, uh, you know, Tafari Benti, he was an Oromo. Uh, and Mengustu Haile Mariam, himself was an Oromo, you know, and um, and that's it. And you had you had Amhara uh, uh, people and also others there. But you know, the reason that Tafari Benti was chosen uh, to be to, to to be the the main leader of the Derg was because he was Oromo. This needs to be used. so there was that mentality there already. And to view, you know, the monarchy belongs to the Amharas and, and, and the monarchy is uh, the dominance, uh, the, well, the monarchs are Amhara. So uh, anybody, you know, when you remove the monarchy and you, you bring a communist regime, then it's not going to be an Amhara who's going to be sitting on, on there uh, in the position of power. So that's what happened. And then after that, we have, you know, the TPLF story, which is another you know, bloody anti-Amhara regime. And now it's gotten even worse. So, yeah. Yeah, so what, so basically in, a, in, in mass, the last time the Amhara were in charge or were rulers would have been formerly the 70s. So we're coming on next year uh, or maybe you could count it depending on 73 or 74, uh, 50 years or so since that has been the case. And what what is it that's going on? For example, we hear a lot of talk. I know you've, you've been leading places on YouTube, on Facebook, and especially in Twitter spaces dialogues for people to understand i i remember catching just the latter half of of one of them where people were going back and forth about what language was used or to use in the amhara association of america's reports on what's been going on i've heard numbers between in the past week or so 200 to like 1500 or 1600 in terms of the system that we have now, which is the TPLF system, which although they have been formally taken out of power, the system they put in place has not fully been displaced. As far as I know, Raya Azabo and Welkait 
have been kind of reincorporated de facto, but not de jure, into the Amhara region. But the system has it so that you're both basically supposed to be confined or condensed into the region of your ancestors. But as we talked about this long history to today, the Amhara have a habit of not being confined to one region, of, of, of living, of moving, of spreading, of intermarrying, of going all over the place. And particularly the ones in Western Walagga have it seems not been able to be protected. I have friends who live in Addis nowadays who always call me back. And some of them have told me, for example, their business arrangements when they have to sign a contract nowadays, just outside of Addis, like in the, in the border of the so-called Oromia region, they have to sign a contract that is translated in Amharic for their own consumption. But then the official document is written in a foreign script in the Latin script or the Roman script with the Oromo language, which was at once uh, written uh, at least by a, a few major figures in the Gittes script. So there, there seems to be, if not a second, like, like, I don't know, less than second class citizen, third, third class citizenship where we're basic security and life is not being uh, protected. And I wonder when you, when you look at, you know, as you said, things enshrined in the constitution that promote this, what is it systemically or, or structurally that could be changed so that people aren't being wantonly killed for their, their ethnic background? Well, it's actually very simple in my opinion. Uh, like I'm an advocate for changing the ethnic constitution because it's, it's not focused on equality and justice uh, for all, right? Because that's it's a, it's a pretty simple concept, equality of opportunity and justice. And it doesn't matter what you are. It doesn't matter what race you are, what ethnicity you are. You can even be white or like black or anything you want. If you're born in Ethiopia and you have like an Ethiopian passport in an ideal sense, right? Then you should be part of society. You know what I mean? Why would you be seen, let alone, you know, being like an Ethiopian your entire ancestry is from there and now you're being treated like like an outsider not only that you're being uh, hunted like 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 an animal and you're you're being killed so what you do is you ensure the like you you had like there needs to be a night watchman you know like uh, a government that looks after the well-being of its people which means that you ensure that people can uh can live without the threat of being killed uh, or slaughtered. So that that's not hard. You, you just make sure that there's the necessary uh, um, protection <clears throat> uh, in order to ensure the livelihood and, uh, and well-being and uh, continuation of, of, of the people, whatever, regardless of their ethnic identity. And it can be done if there's the will to do it, but what we can see and what we can infer, infer uh, by observing the action of the government is that uh, there's an intentional, you know, actually right before a massacre of Amharas happens, like the night before, the government moves uh, the military or, or whatever force that is there protecting the people. They move them away. You know, they, they remove them from the area and then next thing you know, there's a great mass that occurs. So there's an intention there, you know? So, uh, and I've personally been saying for at least, you know, uh, the past four to five years that before TPLF comes, uh, comes down or like leaves uh, power or the, you know, federal central government, we have to have a plan, <laughs> you know? And there mm -hmm. was no plan there was a movement that thought that, you know, you just unite Amharas and Oromos and then you get rid of TPLF because they're the devil. And then what comes after that? Oh, nothing worse than TPLF can come. Oh, you didn't, you don't know. You don't know what's coming, you know? And it was the uh, Oromo extremists were already like ready for this because they'd been working as an ethnic group, you know, like uh, as an ethnic political faction, right? Uh, 
with all their elite like uh, uh, thinkers being extremely ethnic ethnocentric uh as opposed to the amharas right <clears throat> for decades so immediately they populated that that void you know like they 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 became the government so it became we replaced tplf with a with a, an even worse uh ethnic uh ethnocentered hateful especially toward amharas uh government that and you know this government came with a vengeance because they viewed Amharas as their uh, worst enemies, you know? Uh, and as soon as they got, and they never envisioned it, even thought that they would be uh, in this position, but because an ignorant uh, generation came about that was never aware of like the intricacies of uh, past history, they just walked in, <laughs> you know? This generation just actually supported them and put them in this place of power. And now they're massacring. They're, they're committing genocide on them. You know what, yeah. and you know what they say? They say, go back to the Middle East where you came. That's what they say when they commit this. They say, this is our land. Go back to the Middle East where you came from. You know? So... Yeah, so okay, you know, no, it's, it's it 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 uh, it doesn't make sense. Um, the TPLF, I don't know if it's apocryphal or if it's real. I had heard that Prime Minister Mendes, behind closed doors, had said a direct confrontation with the Amhara wouldn't be fruitful for his political faction because they would lose. So they had this idea of this long-term war of attrition, you know, slowly annexing the lands, and and then slowly just pushing people in to their region of origin, but not really allowing them full citizenship in other places and trying to empower whom they viewed as oppressed minorities, and by that, sowing seeds of discord and division. What what I see, you know, you were talking about certain Oromo political factions, at least formally, and <clears throat> this was asked on a recent Al Jazeera appearance of a few different people who are different style, although I think it was in, an imbalanced panel. I think it was like two against one. I don't think it was a really balanced panel. But uh, it was one of the more fair ones. Uh, Al Jazeera has put out a lot of BS against us. But it was one of the more fair ones that I recently watched. And it was an interesting question. Was that at least formally, at least externally, you see a difference between the overt public rhetoric of the regime in power, which uses the language of unity which uses the language of a pan-Ethiopian identity and centralization, which is almost a throwback in some sense to the Dirk uh, before the TPLF's vision of just balkanization via massive decentralization. But there's another faction that is explicitly talking about, you know, Finfinne Kenya, Addis Ababa belongs to us, and, you know, this city of millions we're going to take it over and we're going to uh separate and have the oromo region uh which is much larger <laughs> you know oromuma establishing this area uh oddly shaped <laughs> in the middle center left right all over ethiopia you know from Gondar and wello down to everywhere in the south uh and they want to like secede like the the south and the us and other secessionist movements all over the world how do you view that at least formal explicit difference between the regime in power which is talking about kind of one ethiopia that would have like oromiña marinya tigrinya guraginya somali all over the place versus the the kind of explicit rebel groups who are allegedly fighting with the government and who are claiming that they want to fully secede. 
Like we've never heard the prime minister or any other, I think people kind of make it super explicit. Like some of the lower ones, maybe like Shemendis and people you've, you've heard talking about Addis Ababa and stuff. But in terms like of a full secession, there seems to be a formal difference. Do you, you don't, do you not see that difference or? Well, um, I see a difference of strategy, but I don't see a difference mm -hmm. of mentality. You yeah. know, I, I think that, uh, you know, it's a strategy for a, a current prime minister and, you know, others work with him or in the most, you know, important positions of power there who are all from the same ethnic group, you know, uh, or more, the ones, I mean, I'm not talking about, still have like others that he involves that are working with him, but like the ones who, who are making the you know the uh, key decisions uh they they have a grand plan i mean they uh, they appear as you know people don't know what they're doing but they do and that has always been you, you can see uh, you know once you understand the ideology that they come from and then you observe their actions then immediately you understand that's the inference i'm talking about you can understand what they're about and they're deeply and profoundly uh, organized uh, and have been organized in order to achieve just that uh, they look like they're failing but that itself is a strategy in the oromia region which was created by tplf some 30 years ago or, or a little less um they're trying to cleanse uh, you know like the, they're they're trying to cleanse Am Am amharas from that region uh, and that's why they sporadically, you know, they they commit like a massacre in an area. But then the reverberation of that is that, you know, uh, when the Amharas living there feel unsafe, they just leave. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're, these are like... They're displaced, farmers. yeah. Yeah, displaced. That's what they want. What they want to achieve is they want to shock the people by committing like a, you know, a massacre. And then the rest of the people are going to think, okay, so... Today was uh, Kabeda, tomorrow it's going to be me. You know? So they, they just then, because they're not armed people, they're now they're, it's like being in a foreign land, pretty much, even though ancestrally they've lived in that area for a long time. After the establishment of uh, ethnic federalism, now it's no longer their land. You know, they're not even, you know, they don't even have political representation, by the way. Zero. They have no political representation. They're like in a foreign land. They're like aliens in a foreign that's how they're treated. So uh, they don't have the capacity to defend themselves. So what they do is they uh, they just leave. You know, there's a mass displacement. You know, in 2019 there was a there was a report that uh, Ethiopia had become the most internally displaced country in the world, worse than Afghanistan and Syria combined at the time. So, uh, and that was like with, with the aftermath with like ISIS and all the other problems, you know? So, and those, the majority of those people are Amharas, you know, because they're the ones being cleansed from all these regions because, you know, they live everywhere and they're not like, there's a core area, but like Amharas, you can find Amharas everywhere in the country, like 40 million people. In Oromia alone, you have some 10 to 15 million Amharas. Uh, wow. but, but now it's like, the numbers, you know, the the rate uh, of of growth and reproduction is diminishing. You know, Amharas are like they're, they're not they're in danger. Amharas are just in danger in general. You know, culturally, there's a genocide, a cultural genocide, trying to like erase the uh, culture and values and expression of Amharas, and then uh, politically. Uh, and physically, there's a chance, you know. So <clears throat> that's what we're dealing with. And also, the Tigrayan people are also suffering. I mean, like even though there, there was a war between the Amharas and Tigrayans, uh, instigated by TPLF and, and Abi's government, but at the end of the day, you still find, you know, if you go to Tigray, you know, the, the children and everything were like suffering. You know, the famine and everything. That 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 itself it tells yeah, non-combatants. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the plan that Abi and and his group now in power that they came with, it, it needs to be understood. They want to eradicate 
what they consider the dominance of the Semitic or Abyssinian culture. They want to, they are trying to replace, you know, it's funny because here, like conservatives here in America talk about uh, replacement, replacement, right? The great replacement where they feel this threat of like, you know, minorities and other people trying to like replace their values. It's funny that I don't want to compare this to that by no means because we're seeing like terrible things happening as a result of like this notion of replacement, uh, like, you know, you know, massacres actually, or, you know, what some white extremist is, you know, going to places killing minorities. That's, that's deplorable. Senseless. Yeah, senseless. Yeah, senseless and deplorable. But <clears throat> I don't know. I, I have not like assessed or, or even tried to study that concept of replacement here in the States where I don't know. Uh, it's veracity. I don't. I don't know if it's true. I, I think it's dangerous. If there are people who are anti-white people, that's dangerous because seventy percent of the population in the U.S. is white. You know. Yeah. And the fu- the and- fundamental difference is they they came here and did the indigenous Holocaust of the people who were there, or wiped out over ninety percent of the population that was here, and in doing so, brought in the African slaves and. In that context of the founding, they were the majority people, you know, anywhere from 60 to 80 percent. And so, yes, with the amount of open immigration and and uh, assimilation and integration that goes on at some point, whether they're going to be a majority or not is certainly going to be endangered. I think the big difference is, as we mentioned in Ethiopia, the Amhara who came over didn't come over and commit some sort of indigenous holocaust they mixed with the people that were there and built that civilization that we know as the oxamite civilization ethiopian abyssinian civilization precisely and we got to understand that uh this like the ancestors of the amharas have been in the land for like at least for like four thousand years you know and and at least even traditionally uh gazian or the like pre pre uh, Semitic, like the proto Semitic stock has been around for for two thousand to two thousand five hundred years BC uh, in Ethiopia, you know, and then and then more and more people like three thousand years ago, uh, you know, the, the the back migration three thousand years ago, and and all of that has been has been happening and building, but uh, the S- Semitic speaking stock and identity that Amhara's descent from has been in the land for like over 4,000 years. 4,000 to 4,500 years. You know, since the times. So we are the founders of this country. We are the founders of the civilization. And the ones who are, you know, the people we're talking about, like uh, like political extremists who, uh, view themselves as, you know, representatives of uh, the Oromo ethnic group, for example, they consider themselves to be the original owners of the land, but they were never there. They migrated there in the 16th century. Prior to that, they were, you know, in different places like the Kenya and Tanzania area. You know? And uh, I like to say that Tanzania <laughs> that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like pe- people will hear the 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 confluence of American English, British English, and perhaps uh, French in your yeah, in your yeah, lexicon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely, it's 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 an amalgamation yeah. of different different. Yeah. And Amarinyan is <laughs> definitely definitely. So uh, so yeah, so there's that, and uh, you know they migrated from those areas, and and, yeah. and they were they're nomadic people. You know they were moving around everywhere. So mm-hmm. when they got, you know, that chance of, uh, you know, there was a war between the Amhara uh, power uh, in, of Abyssinia at the time and the Turks and Ahmed Krain, who was uh, from the uh, Adil Sultanate in today's like Somalia and Somaliland region, right? <clears throat> and, and, and himself uh, of that Adare stock, if I'm not mistaken as well, right? So he, well, he yeah. himself is of connection ancient mm-hmm. connection to that those original agazian or aksumites 
Well, yeah. Uh, so some argue that some argue that he's of Somalian ancestry, and I've heard both. Yeah. He, Others argue that he is uh, from the Adelie stock, like from you know. Uh, but you know, whatever it is, he was uh, his allies were the Turks, and and there was yes there was a war like a great war there and, and yeah. because of that war because the kingdom was weakened you know it was very easy for the Ottoman powers to you know expand northward or and also from the also from the east and uh and yeah, yeah. so that's the reality you know? <laughs> they took advantage of that historical situation of 11 years of the country being overrun almost completely destroyed with the exception of if I'm not mistaken, parts of Gojam, Gwander, uh, Tigray, including the Tigrinya speaking highlands of of Eritrea. The way I hear you talk about the the kind of the current regime in power in Ethiopia now and the rebel separatist secessionists, you make the American analogy. If I can, it reminds me of the debates that I see, because I grew up in a very liberal area between in the West Coast and LA, the liberals and the progressives, self-styled. Uh, of course, on Fox News, they just call them all liberals. But when you hear them talk about themselves, they say so-and-so is a liberal, so-and-so is a progressive, kind of epitomized by the more left-wing Bernie Sanders and the more run-of-the-mill Joe Biden. And they attack each other in the primaries, but ultimately the one endorses the other. And so uh, while every analogy breaks down, I think there's some relationship you know from the uh the antifa and the democratic socialists of america versus the kind of official machine of the democrat party of the democratic party i i see maybe some similarities there if if you would uh, appreciate that analogy yeah i mean um i'd like to know more like how you relate that to like the uh, the the Amhara situation. So so yeah. So because you're saying that there are strategic or approach differences oh, yeah, between yeah. how the go. prosperity yeah. party and the rebel separatists that's, act, that's, but that's the, perfect, the end goal is the same. That's a perfect analogy. Now, yeah, I, I was connecting the dots. And thanks for that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is a it's a great example because uh, the, you can say that the rebels on the ground are more, you know, uh, extreme, uh, at least in the outward, right? And then the ones who are uh, like in power, they come there. They come from the same ideology, but are trying to like integrate everybody else into their thinking. But I guess that um, at the end of the day, what's important to understand is that Abi and his group in power now, they are working toward him from my observation. You know, uh, they're working toward the oromization of it. They're trying to bring about a supremacy of the Oromo identity and try to equate Ethiopia to Oromo. So they're trying to define Ethiopia as, you know, the values of like what Oromo uh, or, 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 or almost uh, uh, considered to be their values and culture. And we know that because recently uh, the head of the Oromia region, Shemet, that you mentioned earlier, he tweeted, he, he, he tweeted something that was very controversial and I had talked about it. He said, back to our origin, we're going to bring about, you know, the Gada system and, and introducing the Gada system to Ethiopia. So, what does that mean? Back to our origin? That's not my origin. Like that's not uh, whose origin are we talking. About? And, and, and that's also saying that what has been in place until now is not art. It, it's something foreign from the outside. So we're getting rid of that, and now we're trying to make it more, uh, you know, like uh, what should have been. And I wonder about that because I know some of the more traditional Muslims who are Oromo are against certain things that are considered uh, part of that culture connected to the Gada because it's almost inherently linked 
to the Wakifana religion, is. which is the indigenous religion of the sky god and the various spirits and ancestors that are worshipped or venerated alongside and, and the trees and the rivers and other ceremonies. Um, and I've seen different Protestant Oromo go back and forth on whether or not, like some of them say it's okay, some of them say it's not. There, there does seem to be an inherent tension there. I wonder if he's calling for a return to the Wakifana religion uh, alongside... Trying, they're trying to institutionalize uh, their their ethno-religious system. It's an ethno-religious system uh, that their the ethnic group has you know, practiced for a long time, and that's how they organize themselves. And they're trying to turn that into a modern uh, version of, of uh, what what it is, you know, and, and yeah. their argument is that, you know, it's a democratic system and so forth. Yeah, I, I think the Geda, by the way, is an interesting system. I've studied, I read Asmarom Nagesa's book, the Eritrean who wrote on the subject. Um, Democracy is his second book. His first book was specifically Geda. And it is interesting. It would be interesting to incorporate in some reasons, <clears throat> some areas and in some ways. If they're talking about using it in a top-down fashion, that would be ridiculous. And one of the things I mentioned yeah. with uh, Deacon Salomon when he was on the program is that, as you mentioned, they're coming. Uh, I've heard some people say they kind of originated in Somalia and went around, you know, Kenya, Tanzania, like you've said. Some crazier people made me chuckle when they say Madagascar. I don't think that. But the, uh, as they went north, the more north they went during the, even that weekend time, the more assimilated they got to the point where we have the, the Yeju dynasty is yeah. fully incorporated. And these people are converting to Orthodox yeah. Christianity. I wonder if you know the background of the prime minister himself. I've never heard him explicitly talk about it, but I had heard people say, I know he has the Muslim father and that he's a convert to Protestantism, but I thought his, his mother was an Orthodox Christian. And if, and if so, I wondered if she was one of the uh, Amhara, either from Wadlo or somewhere that had went to, to Jimma? Well, he denied it on an interview on, uh, on I believe it's called ONN, which is like mm -hmm. an Oromo media. And he, he said he was through and through Oromo and that he completely denied uh, being half Amhara. But, yeah. but when he was introduced to the Ethiopian public as you know the new prime minister, he capitalized on the notion that he was half Oromo and half Amara because the movement was also like uh, constructed in that sense, saying that, you know, uh, Amharas and Oromos are going to come together and get rid of the, you know, ethnicist, uh, ethno fascist to grind TPLF, right? So that, well, that in itself is very ethnic. And also, it was from the get go, it was problematic uh, as a strategy. And yeah, and here we are suffering, you know? Yeah, I, I hear, <clears throat> as we close out, um, I, I hear a lot of people, they'll learn all of this information. And then, like you said, a lot of times there's no plan. Um, and, you know, obviously some plans are for the people directly on the ground there and behind closed doors and other plans are, are more public. For a more public-facing plan, whether it's Amhara on the ground in Ethiopia, Amhara in the diaspora, non-Amhara Ethiopians, and all the non-Ethiopians. I get a lot of non-Ethiopians, especially who have kind of high trust of mainstream news, who've been totally baffled by all of the stuff in the news over the past two, three years, uh, particularly the use of the, the term genocide. I've personally been against the term just because I believe it's a UN term. And for me, the UN and the League of Nations were always against us. They never helped us. And it was fake when they accepted our, our membership. We had the great, uh, is it Fitaurari and uh, Haida Selassie himself um, speak to them. But they never helped us during the Italian invasions. And so I try to not use their terminology. But I know people have been, you know what I mean? Like there are other ways of... of of saying it, of, of what, the point we want to get across, like targeted mass murder of people based off of their ethnicity, you know, perceived or, or real and, and different ways like that. But I, I know that there are Amhara, non-Amhara Ethiopians and non-Ethiopians in general who would like to advocate. What would advocacy of the Amhara look like? What would be a sort of uh, a thought or a plan what sort of action steps could 
people take? What would you recommend? You know, does it begin with reading? Is there a place where you want them to send money where hopefully they don't get in trouble with the government? Like what, what, what can they do? You know, a prayer, like, what is it? Well, good. I mean, it's, there are multiple ways of uh, being of help. One is to spread the, the awareness uh, of who the Amhara people are and that they're uh, experiencing what they're experiencing now. I, I use the term genocide in a more etymological sense, right? When I use it, you know, gene and, you know, mm -hmm. mur mass murder, yeah. like, you know, trying to wipe Homicide. out. Homicide, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, <clears throat> um, but I understand your point, you know, I, and I can, I totally agree with you in that sense. And it works though when I, you know, when we use it, it works, people understand what yeah. we're talking about. So, uh, Magbabiano. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, genocide, uh, that, that's happening. With, there are uh, groups, for example, there's genocide prevention in Ethiopia that, that's run by a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Sunait. Uh, she's very, uh, she's very good at, she, you know, they collect a lot of data about, you know, what's happening there in Ethiopia uh, and, you know, uh, the genocide of Amhara people. There's Triple A. Amhara uh, Association of America, they also do the same. Uh, at least the ones that are, you know, there are institutions that are, that are being built and that, that are there. Um, in regards to information as to who the Amhara people are, there's an or organization that focuses on the image and psychology uh, of our people and the preservation of our legacy called Ethiopian Royal Congress. It's run by me, I'm the head of it. Uh, I followed recently on Twitter. I saw that call you put out. And I know Dr. Sun Knight is also on Twitter. And I've seen several members of the Amhara Association of America on Twitter and Facebook, and they have their own web page as well. Yeah. So all of these people, and there are different uh, uh, civic organizations, like everywhere in almost in every state for Amharas. There's uh, Amhara Heritage in Minnesota, for example. There are different. Anyway, all of them sort of like can provide people with uh, sources and guidance as to how to help and and how to approach uh, the issue in general and how to go about it because you know some of us have been involved in studying this and like different trying different things to bring about awareness for a long time i i've been in it for like seven years mm -hmm. you know so um there's that but also the best thing to do is uh, you know, uh, spreading awareness, that's, that's very important, but also creating, you know, try to create pressure uh, in, in a diplomatic sense, right? So joining these, supporting, uh, probably monetarily supporting as well, and also intellectually supporting, uh, or any other way you can support these organizations, because th these organizations are focused on getting the job done. Like, uh, you know, there are strategies that we're not going to talk about strategies right but like there are strategies as to uh you know how we can protect people that's the most important thing right now is preserving the people's values and culture and also physically protecting you know uh who are uh, targeted in ethiopia so there's a lot of there are organizations that there's one organization that called wemfel that was able to raise a lot of money to well relatively a lot right but it's it, it's good that you know people are contributing to sort of uh, you know for disaster relief for example and you know to help uh, people who are suffering in, in the immediate uh, uh, aftermath of like an attack or something you know so uh, yeah there are things that uh, are being done and supporting these uh, different organizations would be would be one uh, specific thing to do in order to help. Thank you. And are you hopeful in general or or more pessimistic about, about the situation? And, and if you are hopeful, is there a word of hope or encouragement you can give to the people back home as, as well as in the diaspora? Yeah, sure. I am very hopeful because I've seen the change. You know, The greatest uh, challenge in my opinion, was to bring people to understand the reality thereof, you know, what's happening. 
a lot of people were in denial. Denial. The majority of people are in denial. And people were dying, people were dying, people were dying for years. And now there's a like vast uh, number of people who are now concerned and trying to make a difference. So that in itself, that change came about. I've seen it happen and you know, I've contributed a lot to that as well. So I am hopeful. And, and at some point, you know, when we're like better organized and get stronger and everything, we're going to we're going to save our people. We have to, you know, and if it's not us, it's going to be the next one because we're we've already built something. And, and you know, whoever is going to come and take over is going to have to sort of like use these resources and leverage to accomplish that. You know, So that's all I say. And one last sentence that I could say is. Be strong and fight for justice for the Amhara people to the end. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me on the program. Thank you very much, my brother Henok. See you soon.